This week, we are going to talk about outreach to the West. We're actually going to pick up in the middle of Paul's second missionary journey and uh, talk about the rest of that in Paul's third missionary journey, because Paul had three great missionary journeys. Some people say four, either because they think that his trip to Rome, when he was arrested and taken to Rome, was kind of a missionary journey, because at least when he got to Rome, he spent you know, uh, a very long time under house arrest preaching in Rome. And he, he'd said earlier, we'll see that today, that he wanted to go to Rome. In fact, he also wanted to go to Spain. Um, we don't have anything in Scripture about this, but uh, there is a tradition that Paul was released from his imprisonment in Rome, which is where we find him at the very end of the book of Acts, and that he actually fulfilled his desire to travel further to the west and visit Spain. In fact, there are some traditions that say he visited Spain and Britain, which is the furthest reach of the Roman Empire at that point. So, uh, but again, there are strong traditions that he was in Spain, that he then came back to the eastern Mediterranean, uh, and that he was arrested again, taken to Rome, and it was there he was tried and finally executed. All right? But we don't have co confirmation of that last trip to, to Spain, but there's strong tradition for it. And also, it sort of, it sort of um, looks more likely because of the fact that Luke ends his gospel, his, uh, the book of Acts, so abruptly. You almost get the feeling that, okay, well, where's the next chapter? Something else is going to happen here. If the only thing that happened after that was that he was in prison for two years and then he, and then he was executed, or for some period of time executed, it seems like that would have been a fairly easy conclusion to that book. The fact that it's left hanging, you know, is an indication that it may have been that Luke's intention was to come back at some point and write the rest of the story. And he didn't, uh, for whatever reason, but... Again, tradition has it that Paul went to Spain. All right, now let's talk about. We'll know someday. We will. It'll be fun to find out. So tell us what happened in Spain, Paul. Um, you guys have seen this. I always include it in there so that you have a reference point for the details. Luke, uh, the right, the author, the only Gentile author of any book of the Bible. Uh, period of time, 62 to 69, uh, in that range. Um, and. Jesus had told his disciples, be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the other most parts of the world. And to a great extent, the growth of the church follows that pattern. And so you can actually outline the book of, this is one way you can outline the book of Acts. You can do it other ways as well. Um, some people have looked at it and talked about the major characters, because early on, um, Peter is very clearly the strong character. John, a little bit. Then you have sort of one-off kinds of things of Stephen and Philip, and then Paul comes on the scene, and from there on, it's pretty much all Paul after the Council of Jerusalem. Okay? All right, we're picking up, right, um, we left off <laughs> last week <laughs> in the book of Acts. Um, Paul has been in Thessalonica, uh, the church that he later wrote two letters to, First and Second Thessalonians. And in the church in Thessalonica, um, he's preaching, and the Jews have gotten really angry about him being there preaching, and they go down to the marketplace and hire a bunch of thugs, and they uh, start giving them trouble, and, and uh, the, the, the people who've become believers there at Thessalonica are trying to protect Paul, and that's where we find ourselves as we pick up this week. As soon as it was night, the believers, that is the believers in Thessalonica, sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Berean Jews were a more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. But when the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God in Berea, some of them went there too, agitating the crowds and stirring them up. The believers immediately sent Paul to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed at Berea. Those who had escorted Paul brought him to Athens and then left with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. It's weird for me to read this. I keep reading Berea, and that's where I went to college. And so I say Berea, and it said something, you know, I hear something else. Um, now, Thessalonica and Berea are about 50 miles apart. And Berea um, is not on the Ignatian Way, which is the main road. Which means these, these Jews at Thessalonica were very serious about trying to stop Paul, so much so that they were willing to walk 50 miles, and not on the main highway, they weren't on the Carretera, they had to go you know, side streets, back streets, in order to try to stop him from preaching there. 
Uh, so, I mean, that'd be like saying, I don't like what somebody in Guadalajara is saying, so I'm going to walk up there and stop them. Okay? Uh, they were pretty intent on doing this. The other thing that you notice here is that unlike, unlike the Jews in Thessalonica, the Jews in Berea, it says, were of more noble character. They received the message with great eagerness, but they didn't just take it in wholesale. It says they examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. They did not blindly accept it, but they had a reasoned response to it. They didn't immediately, you know, uh, deny it because of pride or, you know, which is one of the problems that the Jews had at Thessalonica, um, nor did they immediately take it in. One of the marks of a true religion is that it should be questioned, and it shouldn't be afraid of being questioned because if it is true, then truth will out. If it is God's truth, then that truth will remain evident. Anytime you see a situation where somebody is forced to accept something or somebody is, is persecuted you know, for asking questions, there's something wrong with that. Okay? This is a beautiful example of how the right balance is. They listened, they didn't immediately reject it, but they also didn't immediately accept it. They asked questions, they studied the scripture to find out if what Paul was saying is true. And of course, that means the Old Testament. Anytime here we talk about scripture, we mean the Old Testament. Because Paul, like Peter, like Stephen, you know, everybody else, their testimony to the Jewish people especially was to speak from the Old Testament and how Jesus, the Messiah, is the fulfillment of the Old Testament promises of God, which is kind of the theme of, of Acts, how God fulfilled his Old Testament promises through uh, establishing and growing the church of Jesus Christ after Jesus' ascension. So these rabble-rousers from Thessalonica come up to Berea, they're causing more problems, and the believers, those who have just accepted Jesus, because of Paul's preaching, they take Paul to the coast, and, and I don't even have a map right here, but we looked at it the other day, and Paul goes to the coast and then sails down the coast to Athens, uh, which is the main, Athens is the premier city of all of Greece, even though it's not very big. Athens only had about 10,000 people in it. You compare that to Corinth, which had... Um, 250,000, uh, no, Corinth had 500,000 people in it. Um, Ephesus had at least 250,000 people in it. Athens only had about 10,000 people, but it was still kind of a capital. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but the, he goes down the coast, it's about a 300 mile voyage by sea to go to Athens. Um, and in Athens, he has an opportunity unlike any he had, he's had before. Um, and we'll get into that. But this gives you a little idea of the difficulty he's running into. This is, the story happens over and over again, where Paul will preach in the synagogue, and some of the Jews will accept, but others will, re, will not only not accept it, but will respond violently, and Paul will have to deal with that. Okay? Yes, question. Yes. Uh, Paul must have uh, preached a lot out of the Old Testament. Yeah, almost entirely. Because they're saying that the uh, Jews there, they examine the scriptures every day. Exactly. So they had to examine the Old Testament. Yeah, that's what I was saying, is that when it says scripture, they're talking about the Old Testament. And these Jews knew the Old Testament, and so they're going into the Old Testament looking at it and saying, is, is what he's saying true? Is what Does it make sense? Does this fit together? And many of them decided it did. And it's interesting that when Paul was in, in Thessalonica, the words that it's used, it says he reasoned with them, he explained to them, he proved to them, he proclaimed to them, he persuaded them. All of these very strong, you know, Paul is really working it in Thessalonica. Well, he spent some time in Berea, but there's not nearly the sense that he was working as hard. You know, he was, he was preaching, he was giving them the good news, and they were open to it. He wasn't having to try to break down these barriers that they had in Thessalonica. Uh, so it's a very different kind of environment. And Berea becomes the model for more of a righteous acceptance. Uh, in fact, Berean, an adjective, later on became um, an adjective for somebody who is receptive to the truth. Okay? Oh, he's a Berean kind of guy. It means he's open to hearing the truth, even if it's not what he's used to. All right, then Paul arrives in Athens. Let's read this. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he's waiting for Silas and Timothy, who he sent word back. He left them in Berea and sent word back for them to join him. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace, day by day, with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, 
What is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. When they took him and brought him to the meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. In parenthetical statement here, Luke tells us, all the Athenians and the foreigners who live there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Okay, you need a little understanding about what Athens was in this day. Athens was the cultural capital of the world. Okay, absolutely. Even though it only had about 10,000 people actually living there, it was the center of philosophy, it was the place where democracy was invented, it was a center for literature and art and intellectual pursuits, as you hear here. So it definitely was considered the cultural capital of the world. You know, later on in history, of course, Paris would become that. Today, I suppose, it's Branson, Missouri. I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> but it, it was the, the place, even though it wasn't very big. It was the place where, where 500 years before this, it had been the center of the golden age of Greece. You know, the age of uh, Pericles and Sophocles and all these people. Now, um, several things about it. It, it, had been the form, it was the foremost city, Greek city-state even though, again, it was not that big. Um, when Paul goes here, I want to give you, sort of walk you through this a little bit. When it says, Paul was waiting for them, he's greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. Well, we can follow through this and, and see how Paul proceeded in his experience in Athens. He's there by himself, and it was fairly rare for Paul to be by himself. Usually, he had companions. When he traveled, when he, when he arrived, people were often there to meet him. There were no believers, as far as we know, in Athens at this point. And so Paul is by himself. He walks around the city, and instead of just sort of you know, ticking off the tourist sites that he's seen, actually Athens only has one tourist site, that's the Acropolis. It's a one-horse town, uh, if you've been there. Um, the Acropolis is quite something, and it's worth going there for that, but you don't need to spend a week there. Um, Paul traveled around, and he looked. He paid attention to what he saw, and what he saw was a great many idols. Um, in addition to all the art and the literature and the philosophy and everything, Athens was known for having shrines and temples and idols galore. In fact, the, the Roman satirist Xenon said that you find more uh, gods than men in Athens. <laughs> and the, they had temples to Athena, in fact, on top of the Acropolis. The temple to Athena on top of the Acropolis, which of course is that, you know, that, that's little plateau area right in the middle of the city. The temple to Athena there, Athena being the namesake of Athens, right? Athens, Athena. Um, there was a, a statue of Athena there on the Acropolis so tall they said you could see her spear 40 miles away. An enormous statue. They invested an enormous mall. The Acropolis, all the glory of the Acropolis, that was, those were all temples. That's what that was all about. It wasn't the seat of government. It was where, you know, the, the temples of the various gods. They had temples to Apollo, to Jupiter, to Venus, to Diana. Diana and Artemis are the same. Um, Greek, <coughs> Greek and Roman gods are the same. They have uh, Artemis is Greek. The same god uh, or goddess is Diana in, uh, in Latin. Um, Mercury, Bacchus, Neptune, um, on and on. And so Paul looks around. He sees all these different idols, all these different shrines. And it says he's distressed, greatly distressed. He's troubled by this. It bothers him. Why? Because all these other gods are being honored. People are looking to all these other false gods to try to satisfy the emptiness in their heart, when in fact Paul knows there's only one way that you're going to get satisfied, and that is in Christ. And he's not there at all. He's not honored at all. So what does Paul do? He doesn't just you know, get depressed and you know, buy a bottle of wine and go back to his hotel room. He goes out and starts witnessing to people. These people don't know about Jesus, so he's going to tell them about it. He starts where he almost always starts. He goes to the synagogue, and he witnesses to the synagogue, people in the synagogue, the Jews, and the God-fearing Greeks. You remember what a God-fearing Greek is? It was a non-Jew who was attracted to the idea of monotheism. And so they went to the synagogue, but they were not willing to become a Jewish, full Jewish convert, because of what that involved, like circumcision. You know, like no shelf, no, you know, no shrimp, no lobster, no bacon. There were all sorts of downsides, especially to the Greeks 
who so honored the human body, the idea of cutting part of it off in a ritual, a religious ritual ceremony was just beyond them. And so a lot of these people, God-fearing Greeks, they liked the idea of there being one God that they could believe in, but they were not willing to become Jewish. So Paul starts in the synagogue with religious people preaching, but he doesn't stop there. He then goes out to the marketplace, and it says day by day. He's persistent in this. He goes to the local market, and he's preaching to people. That guy that stands up, you know, and preaches on a soapbox in the corner, that was Paul. He's preaching in the marketplace. And then some of the people that hear him are philosophers, some of these sort of uh, semi-professional thinkers that lived in Athens, the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. Now, these were two of the dominant philosophies of this day. The Epicurean philosophy, which is started by, uh, begun by a man named Epicurus, who lived about 270 BC, died 270 BC, it was, literally means the philosophy of the garden. If you're into philosophy, um, and the idea behind Epicureanism was that there were gods, multiple gods, but that they were too far removed or remote. They didn't really care about people. Everything just happened by chance, you know, uh, and so don't, don't worry too much about the gods. The whole point is try to enjoy yourself while you're here. That's why today we use the word Epicurean for somebody who likes the finer things in life. Well, the Epicurean philosophers said, you know, the gods are kind of distant. Our job is just to make the best of it we can, and so enjoy yourself. So they thought everything is sort of by chance and uh, enjoy the pleasures of life. So Epicureanism was a specific philosophy. They had an understanding, a philosophical support for that, that approach. The Stoics started around the same time by a philosopher named Zeno, and they were quite different. They believed that in God, in, in pretty much in one God, um, and they weren't really monotheistic, but they focused on the fact that the divine essence was kind of pantheistic. You know, the God who was in the trees and the mountains, and the silly thing that you hear people say sometimes that are in the New Agey thing. They were pantheistic, and they believed that the, human, the, the, the purpose of human life was to fulfill your duty, to fulfill your responsibilities, to be moral, uh, to try to stay in harmony with nature and with reason and all of that, and ultimately to accept the fact that life is painful. That's why when you talk about somebody being stoic, it means they accept pain without complaining about it, right? Well, stoic philosophy said, yeah, life is full of pain, and the best thing you can do is just deal with it. But both of these were real philosophies back then. It's not We use the word stoic and epicurean as sort of general descriptive terms now, but they were philosophical systems back then. So these philosophers take Paul, and some of them say, what is this babbler trying to say? Babbler literally means a seed picker, like a bird, that sort of, and it had come to mean anybody who sort of picks ideas out, don't have any original ideas of their own, they take somebody else's and then try to sort of, you know, talk like they know what they're talking about. That's what they mean by babbler. And somebody else said that, uh, or others said that he was advocating foreign gods. Now that's a very important statement, because that's what Socrates was killed for. I mean, he, was, he, he drank poison, but they forced him to drink poison because he, they claimed that he was um, advocating foreign gods. Socrates was kind of a monotheist, actually. And that he was perverting the youth by doing so. And so when you, when for a Greek in Athens to say, you know, he seems to be uh, advocating foreign gods, 450 years before this, 500 years before this, they had killed Socrates for that. So this is a pretty serious thing. Well, then they say, okay, let's let some of our other smart friends hear him. And so they take him to the Areopagus. Have you all heard of Mars Hill? Okay. That's the Areopagus. It's the same thing. Areopagus, Ares was the Greek god who, who, the, whose Latin or, or Roman uh, counterpart was Mars. So Ares, the Areopagus, the hill of Ares, is Mars Hill. Same thing. Okay. It just depends on which translation you're using. Um, that was a place, if you go to, how many of you all have been to Athens? Okay. At the foot of the Acropolis, and when I say the foot of, it's, it's seriously a football field away or something, um, there's this big rock that's flat on top, and there are steps that go up it. They, they've actually put in metal steps now because the old ones were so worn and they would get slippery in the rain and people would fall. But it's a giant rock, probably twice, two or three times as big as this room, that's flat on top. Originally, that had been where a court met, where they literal the legal court. 
But by this time, it wasn't a legal court. It was sort of a philosophical discussion group. But they had responsibility for monitoring and sort of overseeing the religious and philosophical ideas of the city, which means they were kind of an informal court of morals for the religious system. They, they did have some legal ability, uh, again, or still, but not like they had at one point. So he brings, they bring Paul to the Areopagus when it says, and then they took him. Those words actually sort of mean they grabbed him and, you know, it's like they, almost as though he was under arrest. They took him to the Areopagus to see what other people think about what this guy's saying. The potential is there that he could have been really in trouble for this, advocating a foreign gods. So, comes there. And they say, tell us about this, you're bringing strange ideas, explain it to us, this is what they did wrong. Okay. Uh, that, was, that was their hobby. Um, and so he now has an opportunity, he's witnessed to religious people in the synagogue, he witnessed to common lay people in the marketplace, now he's witnessing to philosophers. So he's hitting all the bases. Paul's response to a culture that seems to be lost and unable to find its way was not to moan about it, but to tell them what they're really looking for, to witness to them. And that's what this is all about. And then, the next thing Paul does is he speaks very specifically to it. Continuing, Paul then stood up at the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. He starts out by complimenting them. Okay? He's a smart guy. And this is a beautiful example of being diplomatic and yet being very blunt in your point. I see that in every way you are very religious, for as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. So you are, um, so you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. They had so many different shrines, and so many different idols, and so many different temples. The big concern they had was that they would leave one out, and make them mad, and that God would do something bad to them. The Greek idea of the gods is that the, God, that the favorite hobby of the gods was to do mean things to humans to see how they, how they handle it. You know, That's what all the great tragedy is about. Some god decides to do something to torment human beings. You know, It's sort of like putting ants on a hot plate you know, to see how they dance. That's what the Greeks thought the gods did all the time. And so Paul, is, and they would have an altar to an unknown god to try to keep from leaving one out so that, so that they wouldn't have to you know, deal with the consequences of that. Paul says, this is the thing I want to talk to you about, the unknown God. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Now, several things there. Paul makes a very strong argument that has five points. It continues, you know, point five continues here in a second. Paul declares that God, who is the one you all haven't acknowledged yet, is creator, he is sustainer, he is the ruler, the father, and the judge. The judge part comes up here in a second. In other words, this God doesn't live in dwellings made by human hands. All of your temples really don't cut it. And you, you really don't have a clue. Again, he's being diplomatic about it. In fact, he's being so diplomatic that here at the end he says, For in him we live and move and have our being. You'll notice there's quote marks around that. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Paul is actually quoting two Stoic philosophers there. Um, Stoic philosophers from the 3rd century. The first one is the philosopher Aratus, and the second one is Cleantes. So Paul is so well educated, I think we sometimes miss the fact that Paul really was brilliant. So much so that, as, as you'll see next week, when he, when he appears before uh, Felix and then Festus, Fest and finally Festus and, and Herod Agrippa, um, they say, Paul, you know, your, um, your brilliant mind has driven you crazy. You know, they know he's, he's a brilliant, he's a genius. He quotes, out of hand, Stoic philosophers. 
Now he is a he's a Jewish scholar, but he's from Tarsus, which meant he probably went to the University of Tarsus, which was one of the three primary universities in the Roman Roman world. One was Athens, that was the number one, and then you had Tarsus and Alexandria. Paul is very well educated, he's very smart, he's very diplomatic, he quotes the philosophers these people understand, and they must have been impressed by that. Okay. Questions about any of this? Stop me as we go along. All right. Um, he continues, Therefore, since we are God's offspring, which he just established by quoting a Stoic philosopher, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance. Okay, he's, he's being complimentary, he's being diplomatic, but he's also poking them here. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, um, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Here's the last of those five points I mentioned, that God is judge, and he will judge everyone, and it will be based upon Jesus, who is the Christ, who God proved was the one who will judge by raising him from the dead. Okay? At this point, when you started talking about being raised from the dead, this is not a philosophy, this is not part of the Greek philosophies. And at this, they thought this was pretty laughable. Some of them. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. But others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. I think there's an example where the Holy Spirit was saying, yeah, this is not like anything you heard before, but there's something to this. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. You notice they mention a woman convert here? In the time that this happened and that this was written, that would have been unbelievable. That, you, that The fact that a woman became a convert happened, for one thing, that a woman would step forward and say, I believe, instead of just doing what her husband or her father, depending on her age, said. The other is that it's mentioned here. Um, so, Paul has witnessed to these folks. He broke through to some of them. Others, you know, he's still got a question about. Um, and this is, this is where his time in Athens ends. But this opportunity to speak to these philosophers. Now, some people say, well, Paul's witness to, on the Areopagus to the philosophers was a flop. You know, he didn't plant a church there, he didn't do anything there. Well, that's not true. We have right here, some of the people became followers and believed, and we even have the names of two of them. Now, it may not have been a large church, a significant body, because in principle, he had more opposition probably, more things going against him in Athens than almost anywhere else that he went. Because there's so many different religions. There is the, the Jewish you know, synagogues, don't like what he says, but you've got all these other Greek philosophers that have got their own way of thinking, the people who worship the Greek gods of various flavors all disagree with him. So I think given that, you know, we, we can't say that Paul was not successful here. Paul then goes on to Corinth, another very interesting city. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. Now, um, again, I should have had a map up here. I apologize. I forgot to do that. Uh, Athens is south, kind of central uh, Greece, right on the southern coast. If you go almost directly west from there, you come into what's called the Peloponnesian Peninsula, which is this, you know, this sort of lump of land that sticks out with a very, very narrow isthmus or connecting uh, piece of land between it and the mainland. Corinth, the city, sat right on that isthmus, right on that connecting piece of property which is one of the reasons why it was a center for commerce and why it was very wealthy and why it was a large city. Again, it's heyday, about three quarters of a million people live there, 750,000 people. Um, I, don't, I, I was mixing up my numbers a minute ago, I don't know what I said then, but the estimates are that it, its height, there, there were 750,000 people. The Ephesus had 500,000, very small by, by population was Athens, but it had much more influence than you might think. It only had about 10,000. So, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. At one point, um, 
Claudius, uh, Claudius Nero, you guys saw I, Claudius, the series? Okay, it's pretty harsh in places, but it's really worth seeing. It's about the Roman emperors during this time. There, uh, Josephus tells us that at that time, the Jews were creating all kinds of problems over this person, Crestus, which we take to mean Christ. Um, and so it wasn't actually the Jews who were causing a problem. It's that they were converted Jews, we believe, who were preaching him, and the other Jews were fighting back and was creating such a ruckus that Nero, uh, or not, sorry, uh, uh, not Nero, uh, Claudius ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Well, Priscilla and Aquila were in Rome. That's not where they were from. Pontus, which is where Aquila was from, is on the Black Sea. It's on the northern uh, shore of modern-day Turkey, Asia Minor. But they, had, they were in Rome. They got thrown out of Rome. They're now in Corinth, uh, Priscilla and Aquila. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. He was a tent maker because it was a requirement back then that every rabbi had to learn a trade sort of to fall back on. Um, and so tent maker meant that some people say he probably, probably meant he made leather tents, he was a leather maker. Some say he may have worked in fabric, we don't know. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching. He stopped working, I guess they were helping support him. Testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. So this is, a, this is an example from two places prior to this. Ezekiel does the same thing in the, in the book of the prophet Ezekiel, where he shakes his clothes and said, you know, I'm not responsible for you anymore. And Jesus told the first the 12 and then the 70 when he sent them out, if you go into a town and you preach and they don't receive you, then uh, shake the dust from your feet and leave and you know, their, their guilt is on their own heads kind of thing. This is what Paul is doing here. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue leader, this was the number one Jew in town, um, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. So this is Corinth. Corinth, as I say, was a commercial capital. It was... Um, it was right on this isthmus, and they had built a business in Corinth where when, when they had two bays, uh, Corinth had two harbors, one on the east, one on the west. Ships would come in from Europe to the east harbor, or they could go the other direction too, and if it was a small ship, they had it set up so that they would load the whole ship up on rollers, a skidway, or a sleds, depending on how heavy it was, and take it three and a half miles to the other harbor and put it back in the water. If it was a larger ship, they would unload it, they would move the ship and move the cargo, reload it. And people paid a lot of money for that because the option was to sail over 200 miles around the Peloponnesian Peninsula, and it was a very, it was a dangerous voyage. There were, you know, when you, there were parts of that trip that were rough waters. And so people would much rather do this. Well, Corinth had become a commercial center. Um, because of that, and it was very, very successful. It also was a city that was very proud. Julius Caesar had rebuilt the city of Corinth in 46 BC, completely rebuilt it, which is only, you know, 100 years before this, and they're still very proud of being a beautiful place. They were famous for having uh, twice, every two years they would have sort of a mini Olympic Games called the Isthmus Games, and uh, very famous for that. And Lots of stuff going on in Corinth. It was a major capital city, a major city. They also were known, probably more than anything else, for immorality. What happens when you're, you know, if, you, if you're one port city, it's bad enough, those sailors, you know. Uh, has anybody here been in the Navy? Yes, no, I was listening. Okay. No, I wasn't. <laughs> you were in the Navy? What? You were in the Navy? No, I was listening. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, the, <laughs> I think you're answering a question that I didn't ask. Uh, <laughs> um, here you had two ports, and so it became a very uh, immoral place. In fact, to Corinthianize, we talked about this in our Bible study uh, in uh, Corinth, in Corinthians. To Corinthianize meant to do something immoral. In fact, prostitutes were called Corinthiastes. Um, and so you actually had, let me show you here, um, these are pictures from what's left of Corinth. There's a small town there now, Selchuk, and uh, so none of what originally was the city of Corinth is there. 
This is the temple to Apollo um, that's right in the middle of town. And I commented in our Bible study class, those of you who have heard this before, if you look at this up close, these pillars are monoliths. That means they're made out of one piece of stone. Not I mean, even the little seven or eight foot tall pillars we have for decoration outside our house that are made out of Cantera stone, they, they were two or three pieces. Can you imagine the cost and the effort that was required to do something, those were probably 30 feet tall, 30, 30, 40 feet tall, out of one piece of stone to carve that, you know, transport it there, set it upright, that was a sign of wealth, okay? So that was the Temple of Apollo. This is one of the springs there, the public springs, and so they had a lot of public works. This is the same Temple of Apollo looking across the marketplace. Up here, this is the Acro Corinth. Um, and the, part of the, there was a fortress up here, but more, and, and I only learned this recently, I didn't even know this before. The, um, the temple to Aphrodite was up there. Now, Aphrodite was the goddess of fertility. And at the temple of Aphrodite, they had a thousand slave women who served as temple prostitutes. And at night, I mean, you think that's an awful long way to go. Uh, at night, those thousand women who were temple prostitutes would wander through the streets of the city down below and to get clients. So you get the idea, this was a very immoral place, and uh, this is something that Paul is dealing with. If you go back and read the first and second letters to the Corinthians, Paul deals with the fact that even after they became believers, these people were struggling with immorality. You know, um, one guy sleeping with his stepmother, um, and, you know, very, and, and nobody seemed to be too bothered by it, because that was the kind of environment they lived in, and that kind of thing, okay? So this is Corinth. And at Corinth, Paul planted a very significant church. It had its struggles, but still they were committed to the faith. All right? Any questions about that? Good with that? Okay, let's keep going. Um, one night, still in Corinth, one night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision, Do not be afraid, keep on speaking, do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half. One of the things that you see in Paul's ministry, especially the third, once he planted the churches, the third missionary journey, is he spends uh, almost three years, apparently, between two and three years, in Ephesus. He spends a year and a half in Corinth. He really spends time focusing and teaching in some of these major cities. Again, Ephesus and Corinth were two very significant cities, and he really focused his energy there. Paul really was an urban missionary because that's where the population groups were, and that's where you could communicate with most people. When Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, Achaia was the province of the southern part of uh, what we know as Greece. It's like a state. It, we would think of it as a state. But they had their own governor, just like we have you know, state governors. The proconsul was a governor. When Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul and brought him to the place of judgment. This man, they charged, is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Now, you'll notice they don't specify which law they're talking about. Paul had not broken any Roman laws. In fact, he was reluctant to break any Jewish laws. But that's what they, they're actually talking about, violating the Jewish faith. Well, Gallio is too smart for that. Gallio is the younger brother of the philosopher Seneca, who had been the tutor to the emperor Nero. And don't blame Seneca that Nero turned out to be such a bad apple. He was insane. Okay, Seneca was well respected as a philosopher and teacher. His young, and, and in Seneca's writing, he acknowledged his younger brother Gallio as being one of a very gentle and kindly temperament. He spoke well of his younger brother. That's who this is, Gallio. Just as Paul, so they've accused Paul, and it said, Paul's about to respond. Just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to them, if you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names and your own law, so he didn't fall for that little trick about words, settle the matter yourselves. I will not be a judge of such things. So he drove them off. Then the crowd there turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue leader. Apparently he's the one that replaced Crispus, who became a Christian. They turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue leader, and beat him in front of the proconsul. And Gallio showed no concern whatsoever. Now, there's two ways to interpret that. It may have been that Sosthenes, who was new in this job, he was the one responsible for trying to, to get rid of Paul. And so he's bringing these charges, and when he fell so flat on his face in front of Gallio, 
It may have been that the Jews beat him up. Or it may be that because the Jews were creating a problem and the Gentiles didn't appreciate it, it may have been a Gentile crowd that beat him up. We don't really know. It's not specific. Either way, they grab this guy after he makes these charges that the proconsul won't even listen to. And, you know, they, they wail on him for a while. Um, the interesting part about this is when Gallio refused to hear accusations against Paul and against the Christian faith, he de facto made Christianity legal, at least in Achaia, at least in this very important part of Greece. Because the senior official has said, I won't hear your protests against this. All right? That was very significant. Luke, one of the things that Luke does, and, um, that, and we talked about this when we started out, one of the reasons why Luke wrote this, um, the book of Acts, is to make the arguments as to why it is that Christianity is not guilty of all the charges that were made against it, that it's not a false religion, and one of the things he says in several places is, the Roman officials say it's okay, that it's not breaking any Roman laws, and this is one of the key places for that. Okay? Let's keep going. Okay, Paul has stayed there, is staying in Corinth for a year and a half now. Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time, then he left the brothers and sisters, the church is established, and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off at Sincre. Um, that was one of the two ports. Um, one of the two Corinthian ports was Sincre. Because of a vow he had taken. Let me explain that. Um, the Jews had a vow called the vow of the Nazarite. Samson. You know, Samson didn't cut his hair. Um, Samson was the vow that the Nazarite John the Baptist may have been. You know, he grew his hair out. He never drank alcohol because those are the two, two of the things. Now, most of the time, the vow of the Nazarite was a temporary thing. A uh, Jew did it either when they were petitioning God for something special and really wanted to show God they were serious about it, or when they were thanking God for having granted something and they wanted to show they were serious about it. So they would not cut their hair until the time of that vow was over, and then they would, they would cut their hair. Uh, they would not drink any alcoholic beverages, no strong drink during that period of time. Now, Paul is no longer under the law, but the vow of the Nazarite was not a legal thing. It was not, not part of Jewish law. It was a way of simply saying, I'm very serious about either asking God for this need I have or thanking God for it, which means there was nothing about it that's inherently inconsistent with Paul being a Christian now. And so the, the apparently, Paul has either... It, preparing for the vow of the Nazarite, because since you couldn't cut your hair while you were under the vow, frequently you'd cut your, all of your hair off before you started, so that it would be less of a problem as you're going along. Or, he's completed the vow, and he, he then has his, all of his hair cut off afterwards. Right? Is that clear? And if you want to read about the vow of the Nazarite, it's on any study Bible, you can look it up in the back. You know, there's the details of that. But again, the best example is Samson. Samson, who never cut his hair, um, and others who did not drink alcoholic beverages because they were that. Yes? Why would Paul do that to show him then that he was... Yes. He was doing it as an act of personal devotion before God, I believe. I mean, it was... Not everything was for somebody else to see. You know, Paul is, has a very intimate relationship with God, and so some of what he's doing is, is his own act of devotion. I think that that's probably what this was. And it's simply, you know, because it, uh, Luke is with him, and he... He knows that he did that. He just simply records the fact that before they left, he had all of his hair cut off at Sincre. Um, all right. They arrive at Ephesus, where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. So Priscilla and Aquila are now in Ephesus. He himself went, all, went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews when they asked him. Well, by the way, you'll notice it, that in Corinth, he said, I've had enough of you Jews. He shook his clothes out and said, from now on, I'm going to the Gentiles. What's the first thing he does in Ephesus? goes to the synagogue. No matter how upset he got, no matter how much he says, I'm not going to I'm not even go bother with you Jews anymore. I'm just going to go to the Gentiles. He could not not go to the Jews. That was where his heart was. He was a Jew who really wanted the Jewish people to know that the Messiah had come. And so he couldn't not do that. And so once he got over being angry, first thing he did in Ephesus, and we see it later too, is go to the synagogues again. He went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to spend more time with them, he declined. But as he left, he promised, I will come back if it is God's will. Then he set sail from Ephesus. So this is a very short trip. It's sort of like he's dropping Priscilla and Aquila off, and then he's leaving. 
When he landed at Caesarea, so he, he goes from Ephesus all the way back to Palestine, Caesarea, which is a city north of Jerusalem. This is where Caesarea was where Peter uh, went to meet uh, Cornelius the centurion, and Cornelius and his family became the first Gentile converts. It's the, the extraordinary port city that uh, Herod the Great built. He created a port out of concrete. Um, they really did have concrete back then. The Romans invented concrete. He landed at Caesarea, he went to Jerusalem and greeted the church, and then went down to Antioch. So from Caesarea, he went down to Jerusalem and then back up to Antioch, okay, to checking in with everybody. After spending some time in Antioch, Paul set out from there and traveled from place to place throughout the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. This is the start of his, of his third missionary journey, which without a lot of fanfare. In fact, let me go ahead, I think I've got it a couple slides forward. Okay, so Paul, this is, you see where Athens is here, Corinth is over here, and this is the Isthmus, which is only three and a half miles wide, between the Peloponnesian Peninsula and the rest of Greece, Achaia, okay? And again, Macedonia and Thrace were two other parts of what we think of as Greece, but were separate states from Achaia, okay? He leaves Athens, he goes over to Ephesus, which is here, another port city, very quickly, and then, we don't have any details here. Luke, Luke just gives us very minimal detail at this point. Later on, he gives us exact details of where he went and you know what temperature it was and how the wind was blowing and everything else. He leaves Ephesus and he comes here to Caesarea, then down to Jerusalem, and then back up. Uh, Antioch would be somewhere right up here. Higher. Or higher. Yes, here, of course. What am I thinking? I'm wrong scale. Antioch of Syria. This is Antioch of Pisidia. Antioch of Syria. All right? which is his home base. He's from Tarsus, that's where Paul is from. And that's where I said one of the three great universities of the, of the Roman world was. Um, the uh, Eastern Roman world, Athens, Tarsus, and then down here, Alexandria. All right? So, gives you the picture. Let me go back. Uh, yeah, I did that. Okay. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. Now, I put this in here. I thought about skipping this slide, but there's an important piece, a couple important pieces here. One, Apollos is from Alexandria, which is a city in Egypt, North Africa. And yet, uh, and he's Jewish, um, Alexandria was the second biggest city in the Roman Empire after Rome. And at one point, a third of the people there were Jewish. It's a huge Jewish population. So Apollos is, a, he does have a Jewish name, but he's Jewish, has become a Christian, sort of. Let's keep going, I'll explain that. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord and spoke with great fervor and taught about John, about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he was a Christian, I'm sorry, he was a Jew first. He learned the scriptures. He was a scholarly man. He had been taught about Jesus. But he, but he did not yet know about, it sounds like, really about how even to be saved. He, he, baptism of John is as far as he went, meaning that, a, which was a version of the Jewish cleansing by ritual washing. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. When Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, this, this is where Corinth is, that's where Paul just came from, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. When he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed, for he vigorously refuted his Jewish opponents in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. So he was a scholarly Jew. He had heard about Jesus, uh, apparently wanted to make a profession, but didn't really know a lot about this yet. Now, how did he end up being a, you know, a sort, of, sort, of Jew, sort of Christian Jew from Alexandria? You will remember that Alexandria is one of the places that Jews came from for Pentecost celebration in the second chapter of Acts. And after Peter preaches, the Holy Spirit comes, Peter preaches, 3,000 Jews become believers in Jesus, and after this is all over, they all go back to their homes, including to Alexandria. That is almost certainly where, where Apollos in Alexandria would have heard the gospel, probably where uh, Priscilla and Aquila became Christians because other people carried the truth of the gospel back to Rome, which is where they were, as it tells us people came from Rome. Now, 
I don't want to make too much of this, but you'll notice that it starts out describing to us um, what actually is the previous slide. Uh, it talks about uh, Priscilla and Aquila, and it says Aquila, it tells us where Aquila came from, from Pontus and he and his wife. After that first reference, whenever it talks about Priscilla and Aquila, it mentions them in that order. Which again, what is very unusual for this time to mention the wife's name first. The wife was usually a just follower. The indication here is that Priscilla and Aquila heard him. They invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. Clearly sounds like Priscilla had just as much to do with teaching Apollo as, um, as her husband did. Which is a very, uh, to me, a very important strengthening thing. Um, I tend to believe, I'm not quite as convinced as our old pastor Earl Palmer was, or as Carolyn's mother uh, was, that Priscilla may have been the one that wrote the book of Hebrews. That would explain why we don't know who the author of the book of Hebrews was, because nobody would want to publicly acknowledge that it was a woman, but it was too good not to include. Okay? Possible. Other people think that maybe Apollos wrote the book of Hebrews. Some people think that Barnabas wrote the book of Hebrews. We don't know. But someday we will. Okay, let's take a break. Okay, we just saw two slides back that Paul has gone overland and he started visiting some of the churches in Galatia that he visited before. As I say, that's sort of the, a very low-key entrance into his third missionary journey. And now we get into that a little bit more. Um, while Apollos was at Corinth, now Apollos, when he went to Achaia, he went to Corinth, and later on, Paul, in his letters, acknowledges the fact that, that Apollos had been very helpful in ministry in Corinth. He compliments him about that, so that's really good. Um, when Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived, arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Do you did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. It was repentance for the Jews. Remember, John's baptism was before Jesus. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. This, uh, Are they the first Anabaptists? The, the first... Um, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. Or be baptized. <laughs> Again, remember that John preached repentance, and in effect, what he was doing is a ceremonial washing as a symbol of repenting and turning back toward God. And this idea of ceremonial washing, the Jews expected Gentiles to do that, and so John was simply saying the, the repenting and coming back to God is such a big deal, it's almost like you're being reconverted again, and so that's why you have to go through baptism. But that was not the same thing as Christian baptism. When Paul is talking to these people here, um, and they say, have, did you receive the Holy Spirit? They go, we haven't even heard of that. Well, then, what kind of baptism did you get? Well, we were baptized, the baptism of John the Baptist, which meant, as Jews, they had, got, they had repented and turned back toward God, but they were not Christians yet. They had not made a profession of faith in Christ. And so, when he preaches to them, he talks to them, tells them about Jesus, and upon hearing that, they then were baptized in the name of Jesus. They accepted Jesus and were baptized at that point and received the Holy Spirit and received the gifts of the Holy Spirit to demonstrate that. Okay? Now, where are we here? I showed you this map a minute ago. Again, Paul started out Antioch. That's his base of operations. Remember when he landed at Caesarea, he went to Jerusalem, Antioch. He went overland to his hometown of Tarsus, over to, to some of the churches he'd visited before, and then overland to Ephesus, which is where we find him right now. This third missionary journey, he spends um, two and a half years, maybe as much as three years, they used to round things off, and so it's difficult to know exactly, um, in Ephesus. It became one of the most important cities. In fact, uh, the Apostle John, the youngest of the Apostles, moved there later. It became the elder who's responsible for really being the leader of the, of the, the, the figurehead leader. I mean, he wasn't a bishop or anything uh, particularly, but he was the, the Apostle longest living apostle, and he was the head of the churches throughout all of this part of Asia Minor. Even when he got so old he couldn't walk, they would carry him around in a sedan chair from church to church. Um, he took with him Mary, the mother of Jesus. 
And so Mary and John, the apostle, lived here in Ephesus. There is a place now that traditionally is the home of Mary. We haven't seen that in Ephesus, but I, I hope we can do that, you know, in October. Um, and it was where Timothy ended up eventually as a pastor there. So very significant uh, <clears throat> history, Christian history there at Ephesus. This is where Paul is right now. So, in Ephesus, you remember that it said that Paul had spoken to the Jews and they wanted to hear more from him, and he said, I can't now, but I'll be back if God allows me to. Well, he's back. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. And once again, he swore he was never going to deal with the Jews again, and now here's the second time he's done it. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. The way is what they were calling Christians at that point. Uh, in Antioch, they first called them Christians, and it was considered to be derogatory initially. Uh, but here, they, they described Christianity as the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for uh, two years, so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick, and their illnesses were cured, and the evil spirits left them. Okay, a couple things. Paul left the synagogue. He goes to a public place, Tyrannus, and we're told elsewhere that Paul would, would teach from um, 11 until 4 in the afternoon for five hours. Now, in Ephesus at this time, this, you know, this is out of Mediterranean, things in the city would start early in the morning, and they would go until 11. And at 11, it was like their siesta. Everything shut down. And shut down until 4 or 5 in the afternoon. And then it would pick back up again, and it would run until early evening. Um, again, sort of an extended version of what we know here in Mexico. Tyrannus was apparently a teacher. He had a lecture hall, and it's interesting that his name literally means tyrant or despot. <coughs> and you wonder whether that was his actual name, if his parents called him that, or if his teachers, or his students called him that. Okay, Tyrannus. <laughs> but there's this lecture hall, and so Paul would go there, and Tyrannus would lecture in the morning, at 11 o'clock when it started getting hot, he would go home, siesta. In fact, they used to say in Ephesus that more people would be asleep at 1 o'clock in the afternoon than at 1 o'clock in the morning. And so Paul took advantage of this time when nobody else is using this lecture hall, and he rented it. And so he would lecture during the hot times, from 11 to 4, when nobody else wanted to use it. And yet, people were coming. In fact, a lot of people came. Um, the word, because he was there teaching and preaching for over two years, two and a half years about, um, it says that people all over the region began to learn about the Lord. Now, um, you also have this, era, this part about miracles. This is not magic, all right? Um, this, and this is not something that is, is ordinary or usual. In fact, the language that Luke uses here in, in the, the original Greek indicates, you'll notice it said God did extraordinary miracles, meaning this is not the sort of thing that happened often, <laughs> It's not the sort of thing that we ought to expect, you know, the, the, the televangelists that wipe their brow with a cloth and then, you know, send them $30 and they'll send you one kind of thing. I don't think so. It was extraordinary. And it wasn't Paul that was doing it. You'll notice who it gives credit to. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. So that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick. Their illnesses were cured. The evil spirits left them. This was a testimony to God's power. And it is consistent with the fact that the, the woman in the book of Mark, um, and Matthew 2, I think, uh, the woman who sneaks up behind Jesus and touches the hem of his garment and is healed, it's a very similar sort of thing to that, where um, Jesus, Jesus, it's not something they set up, but the fact is that there was, God did choose to do miracles in those ways. Not something necessarily, and you know, God can do anything he wants, but not necessarily that we ought to plan on replicating today, because it was extraordinary. This is what Ephesus looks like today, well, a year ago. Uh, this is one of the main streets that comes down. Uh, Ephesus, there's a high part of the city and a lower part of the city. This is from the higher part of the city headed down toward the, this is the Library of Celsus, and I'll show you another picture there. At that point, the road turns to the right, and that's this road, okay? Actually, this series of columns, there's two, two paths, this way and this way. Back here, is the major theater, and I'm going to show you a picture of that in a minute. 
This road here that you could just barely see, that is the main road that led from the mouth of the theater down to the harbor. Because Ephesus was a major commercial port, it had a major harbor. One of the reasons it stopped being anything other than ruins is that the harbor silted up so badly they couldn't, you know, it ended up that the ships were so far away from uh, the actual city, it wasn't practical anymore. Right? So they lost their commercial advantage. But this is, uh, Ephesus today is one of the most, one of the most important and extraordinary archaeological sites in the world. You know, there's a ton of stuff you can see there. Up on the hillside, you know, if you're walking down here, up here on the hillside, they've got these, these houses of wealthy people that are built, it's literally built so that the rooftop of one, because goes, this goes up in both directions, the hills. The rooftop of one is the, is the patio of the one, you know, above it. And they're excavating all of that stuff still. You go in there today and there are, you know, archaeologists and workers who are still finding things. There are extraordinary mosaics in the floors and painted walls and, you know, it's quite something. So it's an extraordinary place to visit. This is where Paul was for almost three years. Okay? This is the library um, of Paracelsus. The, most of this has been reconstructed. It's not like somebody showed up and it was like this. They've taken these pieces and put them back together. Um, and then, again, this direction is toward the harbor and the theater. And back up this way, if you back straight up, you'd be going back up the hill. So it's an extraordinary place even today, in terms of the ruins. It must have been quite something back in the days when they had half a million people living there. Mary? Um, the, the, the river silted in, and the ships couldn't get in. The harbor did. The harbor. But has, has that been dug out at all? Has no. There's no, I mean, there's no interest in them turning into a commercial place anymore because they'd have to tear down all the ruins. Oh. And it's miles away now. And it's miles away it's now. Yeah, it's like, it's like two and a half miles from here to the water. Yeah. Okay. Yes? You say that's a library. Were there any scrolls or? All of it was destroyed. No, there's nothing. There was nothing left there. Uh, the city was abandoned. It was attacked several times. It was no longer commercially viable, so it was completely abandoned. There was nobody living there, you know, for a long, long time. I don't even know how what, a long period of time. But then they started going back in and reconstructing it. But because it had been kind of wholly abandoned, a lot of old, a lot of old uh, cities. Whenever the city stopped being viable, people would come and take all the stone and use it for something else. You know, one of the reasons the Colosseum in Rome is is a lot of it's gone is because people were, would come and steal the stone and use it for building buildings, you know, houses and other kinds of things. Well, there's there's nothing close to Ephesus. I mean, there's nothing that, that would make it viable for somebody to come and, and load up all of the stone and take it next door, you know, to the town next door. It's quite a long ways to, or it was in ancient times, uh, to anything. That any place else where people would be, and so it was pretty much left alone. But anything that was usable, like if there'd been scrolls or whatever, it's not like if it, you know, it's not like somebody bombed it and, and, and things were left there. Just the stuff that couldn't be carried off, like the, the stone, is all the stuff. Judy, is there any local people? Did they live there? Or not, not in, not in Ephesus, not in ancient Ephesus. There is a town next door. In almost every case, like I mentioned, Corinth. You know, there's a town right. You know, a small town. It's not a big town. There's a small town right next to what are the ruins of what the ancient city was. Same thing in Ephesus. You know, there's a town right next door. You know, you can you can go grab lunch and then come back and look at the ruins again if you want. Uh, but and that's where locals live. That's where locals live. Yep. And then of course there are a lot of buses coming here from you know from other places. Yes, Mike. I mentioned this up with Beth Shan, but it, was this destroyed by earthquake? Also? No. No. Not that I'm aware of. Beth no. Shan, I think it was. Okay. Yes. Uh, Two things. Can you just go back one? Sure. That picture that you have there on the left is the same one that's in the text. Oh, it is? Well, I took this one. It's uh, page 243. Okay. But the thing that, that I wanted to raise just briefly um, is that the writing that's to the side of the text here, it says, uh, artisans who means for living in, uh, in Ephesus from creating silver idols in her honor. Right. Why is it the message? that man-made gods are no gods at all. Uh, a lot of the resistance, I think, I'd be, I'd be curious, a lot of the resistance uh, and negative reaction to the gospel or the good, good news probably was similar to this. There were an e economic dimensions why sure. people didn't want it, yeah. didn't like it. Uh, yeah. you know, if your idle business is idle, uh, because somebody's <laughs> saying it's not good, <laughs> then, uh, then you're going to resist it. They were resisting. 
Yeah, absolutely. We're going to look at that passage in like two slides uh, okay. where, that, where that comes up. So you're exactly right. In fact, a major reason that people don't accept the truth of the gospel then or now is because it would mean giving up something else that they want. I don't know if I've told the story here, but I know I have a Bible study. Uh, David Watson, who was a wonderful minister in uh, England, who was a PhD in philosophy and taught uh, widely and had these evangelism uh, <coughs> outreach things that he did. I was involved with some of that. Um, he said that, he used an example, he often would speak at universities and then afterwards would talk with students. And he said there was one young man came to him and had all these questions, and David answered his questions. He said, we talked for like two hours. And at the end, the young man said, well, you answered all my questions. There's, I don't have any other problems. And he said, well, then, will you accept Jesus? And he went, no. He said, well, why not? He said, because I have to give up too much. <laughs> you know? There it is. I heard that story before. Yeah, uh, exactly. And, and it's that's true. And in the case of the silversmiths, they that was their livelihood that they'd have to give up. And they not only didn't want to give it up, they didn't want anybody else to. Uh, because they depended upon them. Okay, so let's look at the at these passages. But it's worth going to Ephesus. All right, I'm I'm looking forward to us going back there. But um, as you can see, there's a lot of stuff going on, and I've got pictures of the of the uh, theater in a second. In Ephesus, some Jews went around driving out evil spirits, trying to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon possessed. You know, they found out about this Jesus thing it seemed to work, and so they're going to try it. They would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know about, but who are you? <laughs> then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. I'm sorry, but that's funny. <laughs> You can't call on the name of Jesus secondhand. In the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, whom somebody else believes in. You know, I claim the power of Jesus whom Billy Graham believes in. You know, it doesn't work. It's a wonderful little story. And it's that sort of story that gives the ring of truth to all of this. Okay? Um, when this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear. Okay, this there's something going on here. This is there's some power here. And the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Don't take this stuff lightly. <coughs> Many of those who believe now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls. Now, uh, an, an, an Ephesian letter was a magic scroll. It was so common, magic and sorcery was so common in, Ephesia, in, in Ephesus, that these documents, you know, grimoires or... Uh, magic, in, you know, scrolls of incantations or whatever were called Ephesian letters. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. That's how much an average person would make in 150 years. Because a drachma is one day's wage. So 50,000 days, counting six days a week, is about 150 years. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. After all this had happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem, passing through Macedonia and Achaia. Now think about this. He's in Ephesus, Asia Minor. He wants to go to Jerusalem. Okay, Asia Minor. He's in Ephesus. He wants to go to Jerusalem. So what's he going to do? He's going to go up here first. All right? Um, why? <laughs> well, they're approaching Passover. Any boat that's going from here to Jerusalem at this point is going to be loaded with observant Jews who were headed to Jerusalem for the Passover. What better place to get rid of a guy than on a boat, you know, with when everybody's on your side except him, you know, overboard, right? Paul's not stupid. So he decides if I'm going to go to Jerusalem, I'm not going to go immediately and I'm not going to go directly from here uh, because there was a large Jewish contingent in Ephesus. So he's going to pass through Macedonia and Achaia. After I've been there, he said, I must visit Rome also. He sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus. I showed you the slide before of Erastus' name, where Erastus paid for a roadway. Now if you go to Corinth, Erastus was the governor of public works, or the, the administrator of public works in Corinth. 
he's mentioned several times, he became a follower, not only a believer, but a follower of Paul. And if you go to Corinth today, Carolyn and I actually had to run, up, run around and find this, you know, before the bus left this. Um, there's a place where it's engraved in the stone that Erastus, from the prophets of his ship, paid for this road. That's him. Okay. Timothy and Erastus were sent on ahead. The idea is they probably were sent in order to make arrangements, make everybody ready for the, gather, uh, the, the collection. They were taking up an offering to help the people in, in Jerusalem that were suffering from a famine. And so they probably went on ahead to, to deal with that. Here, um, Timothy is, or I'm sorry, Paul is saying, I must visit Rome also. Elsewhere, he talks about the fact that he also wanted to go to Spain. In Romans 15, twice, he says in the 15th chapter of Romans that I, I want to go to Spain. That's part of why we believe the tradition of him being in Spain is not unreasonable because he, he specifically said he wanted to go to Rome and to Spain. Well, he ends up in Rome, we know, um, although he didn't necessarily go there voluntarily at the time. Then we get to the riot in Ephesus, which is mentioned next to that picture in the book, which is not my picture. I took this one. But every picture of this, that everybody takes a picture of that road, and all of them look basically the same. You just got people with different colored clothes on, I'm sure. When this, uh, sorry, about that time there arose a great disturbance about <coughs> the way. That's the name they use. They use for it again. Christianity. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis. These would have been small shrines for the home. Artemis was the Greek version of the god uh, Diana. Interestingly enough, the Romans, Diana was the virgin huntress. Somehow, Artemis eventually got turned into the goddess of fertility. Uh, in fact, you'll see these images of Artemis where she has like 30 breasts. They think that was because a meteorite landed that was in that shape with all these different sort of mod nodules on it, and they took that to be a symbol of Artemis and her breasts. So if you see this image of a goddess, and it looks like she's got 30 breasts hanging off of her front, that's, that's Artemis, and she was one of the most important deities in the Eastern Mediterranean, okay? So, shrines of Artemis brought in a lot of business for the craftsmen there. He called them together, along with workers in related trades, and said, you know, my friends, that we receive a good income from this business. And you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus, and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says that gods made by human hands are no gods at all. There is danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited. Again, his problem is he's losing money, but he's not he's smarter than to just say, I don't want to lose money. He makes it sound as though this is a threat against a god, our goddess, our goddess. And the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited, and the goddess herself who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world will be robbed of her divine majesty. He made it a religious issue, not an economic one. When they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. In some places you'll hear them talking about Diana. It's the same thing. This is what the Temple of Artemis looked like. This is a reproduction of it in Turkey. Um, elsewhere in Turkey. I mean, the Ephesus is in Turkey. Um, the Temple to Artemis was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. This building, if you can imagine, was 450 feet long. That's one and a half times the length of a football field, for those of you who need perspective was 225 feet wide and 60 feet tall. It had 127 pillars, these marble pillars. Um, several, I mean, there, there are testimony from ancient scholars who, had, who said, I have seen, you know, four of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Some of them were destroyed early. They weren't all available at the same time. And having seen them, the Hanging back Gardens of Babylon and the, you know, the Colossus and the Mausoleum and Parnassus and all these things, and then I came and saw the Temple of Artemis and the others paled in comparison. It was apparently one of the most extraordinary buildings ever. Nothing exists of it now except the foundations, foundation wall, and one pillar, which they put together from pieces of other pillars. It looks like a camel, you know, which is a horse made by committee. It's all these pieces that stacked up there. That's really all that exists of it now. But it was quite something in its day. And Ephesus was known as the home, the home of Artemis. That's where her great temple was. 
And inside this building, there was a statue of her that was 40 feet tall. Gold and silver and ivory and precious gems. Big deal. And these guys all made their living on this, these gold, these silversmiths, all right? Is that, is that full size, that building? I don't think it is, no. Okay, yeah. Um, soon the whole city was in an uproar. The people seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, and all of them <coughs> rushed into the theater together. I'll show you the theater in a second. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Stay out of there, Paul. We don't know what's going to happen here. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. The assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people did not even know why they were there. The Jews in the crowd pushed Alexander to the front, and they shouted instructions to him. He's supposed to be their spokesperson. He motioned for silence in order to make a defense before the people, but when they realized he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is two hours. <laughs> this is um, the theater. This is a shot from up, part way up one side so that you get the idea. Now, the, the, the um, Library of Paracelsus is over here. And this is the road. From here, it goes down to the, to the uh, harbor. Here's something gripping. Um, this is looking up from, you know, from one of the lower sections. And this is the top of it here. You can hardly tell in this, in this line. Um, the, the theater, which was built right in the base, this mountain behind is called Mount Pion, seated 25,000 people. Okay, that's a big arena, big theater. It's over 500 feet wide. So this is where they're having this riot. John? Um, in, uh, in the previous slide, you, you said there were two guys there, Gaius and uh, Aristarchus from Macedonia. Could they have accompanied him like from Korea or somewhere like that to stuck with him? Or well, well, yeah. I, I mentioned earlier that Paul yeah, was always that traveling event. He was alone. <laughs> These guys are from Macedonia, and he hasn't been to Macedonia. Uh, I mean, uh, to that point, a second time, I don't think, has he? Um, I mean, with these guys. I have to go back and look. It's running. I mean, like it's going to make a big difference. Yeah. You know, it's not, but I'm just curious. He has two guys from Macedonia. Well, and they could have met up with him somewhere else. I mean, it doesn't say they came directly from Macedonia. It said they they were from Macedonia. Okay. You know, they right. could have met him somewhere. You know, joined him in Ephesus. Oh. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, the city clerk quieted the crowd and said, fellow Ephesians, doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her image which fell from heaven? That meteorite thing I mentioned? Okay, they believe that, that, that the image of Artemis with all the, the 30 breasts, they believe there was a meteorite that fell from heaven that gave them uh, an, an image of what she should look like, and that's what that's based on. Does that exist anywhere? that I'm aware of. No. Um, call the British Museum. They got most everything. <laughs> they stole it, is what it is. Um, therefore, since these facts are undeniable, you ought to calm down and not do anything rash. Um, so the first point, this, this city official who gets up to speak to them to calm them down, first thing he says is, guys, everybody in the world knows about Artemis and knows that Ephesus is the home of Artemis Temple. This is not going to threaten our religion. We're too well established. That's the first point. He goes on. You brought these men here, though they have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our goddess. Second point. They haven't done anything wrong. Let's, let's be honest about this. They have not, these guys have not done anything. Third. If then Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a grievance against anybody, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. They can press charges. If there's anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in the legal assembly. That's the third point. Is if you've got a problem, take them to court. Press charges against them. Don't drag them in here. And fourth, as it is, we are in danger of being charged with rioting because of what's happening today. In that case, we would not be able to account for this commotion since there's no reason for it. After that, after he said this, he dismissed the assembly. Dismissed the assembly. So the fourth thing is, you guys keep this up, and the Romans are going to be here. There was always the Romans left left people alone unless things got out of hand. 
if there was ever a, a, a scent of riot or upheaval, the Roman military would come in and clamp down. And when the military clamped down, they didn't do it with rubber bullets and you know and water hoses. They lopped off heads. And so the city official here is saying, you guys are very close to getting in serious trouble with the Romans, so you better stop. And then he says, so everybody go home. So his argument was, everybody knows about uh, Ephesus as being the home of Artemis, where worldwide, this isn't going away. Second, these men haven't done anything wrong. Third, if you have a problem, bring charges in the courts. Fourth, you better stop it before the Romans come and stop it for you. And fifth, go home. <laughs> and it happened. It worked. When the uproar had ended, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, said goodbye and set out for Macedonia. So this city official knew what he was doing. He traveled throughout the, through the area, speaking many words of encouragement to the people, and finally arrived in Greece, where he stayed three months. Because some Jews had plotted against him just as he was about to sail for Syria, he decided to go back through Macedonia. So rather than sail directly from there to back to Syria, Antioch, in other words, he decided he's going to backtrack and go back up to Macedonia again. He was accompanied by Sopater, son of Pyrrhus from Berea, Aristarchus and Segundus from Thessalonica, Gaius from Derbe, Timothy also, and Tychicus and Prophemus from the province of Asia. These men went on ahead and waited for us at Troas, us. So Paul, or Luke is with him now, again. But we sailed from Philippi after the festival of unleavened bread, and five days later joined the others at Troas, where we stayed seven days. So we're not sure if this would be festival of unleavened bread. He may be referring to Passover there, because Paul says shortly he's anxious to get back to Jerusalem before Pentecost, which is 50 days after Passover. Or, as Christians, he may have, they celebrated the festival of unleavened bread. That may have been a reference to uh, Easter celebration. Okay? Uh, we got water leaking here. And there's an electrical cord right underneath it. Okay. Yeah, we're chapter 20. Um, this is just a funny thing. We were talking about Paul having companions. We're not sure if he's talking about Easter uh, celebration there or the Jewish Passover because a lot of Jews were still participating in the Jewish, or a lot of the Christians were still participating in the Jewish holidays at that point. So then we come to uh, the rest of chapter 20. On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, kept on talking until midnight. I go five minutes over, and people <laughs> There were many lamps in the upstairs room where we were meeting. Seated in a window was a young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. <laughs> when he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead. Paul went down, threw himself on the young man, and put his arms around him. Don't be alarmed, he said. He's alive. Then he went upstairs again and broke bread and ate. After talking until daylight, he left. The people took the young man home alive and were greatly comforted. There's no great historical or theological content in this, but I just think it's a great story. You know, this Paul preaches on and on. Now, actually, when they talk about that he spoke to the people, some of the words here indicate uh, dialogue. So it wasn't just him talking for... You know, the suggestion is he spoke till midnight and then had something to eat and then talked the rest of the night till morning. Uh, but apparently it was, there was interaction going on. It wasn't just everybody sitting around listening to him, even though Eutychus fell asleep and fell out the window. Um, and again, one of the reasons why I think this is important is why would a story like this be in here unless it happened? There's no way this makes Paul look any better. I mean, it does say that Paul was, you know, God performed a miracle in bringing Eutychus back to life after he was dead. But the fact that he preached all night and this young man was so bored, he fell asleep and fell out of a third story window, that's not really a very positive story for, in terms of Paul. The fact that they don't always just tell you the good stuff, I mean, think about how Peter and the disciples are described in the Gospels. There is a ring of truth to the fact that there's not, they don't candy coat everything. Everything is not just the good stuff. It's the good and the bad, it's, it's, which suggests it's the truth. Okay. Um, so Paul is beginning to head back for home. Now I know that none of you whom, uh, among whom we've gone about preaching. Okay, I'm sorry. I jumped ahead. Yeah. yeah, there we go. I'd already moved the page. Paul is in my, headed to Miletus. We went on ahead to the ship and sailed for Assos. 
where we went to, now he's been to Troas. Troas was the city, you remember, that he left from originally when he first went over to Macedonia. They come back to Troas. Troas is where Eutychus falls out the window. It's north of Ephesus. We went on ahead to the ship and sailed for Assos, which is down the coast, where we were going to take Paul aboard. He had made this arrangement because he was going there on foot. Now, it's a much shorter journey on foot than it is if you have to sail around. And for some reason, Paul wanted apparently to be alone for a while. And so he decided he was going to walk the 30 miles or so while they sailed around the long way. Okay. When he met us at Assos, we took him aboard and went on to Mytilene. The next day, we set sail from there and arrived off Chaos. That's an island. The day after that, we crossed over to Samos, and on the following day, arrived at Miletus. Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus to avoid spending time in the province of Asia, for he was in a hurry to reach Jerusalem if possible by the day of Pentecost. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. Very simply, he knew if I stop at Ephesus, I am not going to get away quickly. It's like, you know, stopping at relatives' house. You're not, you know, don't plan on stopping for 10 minutes. He wanted to be able to talk to the elders at Ephesus, but he knew if he stopped there, they were going to grab him and occupy his time, and he was not going to get away very quickly. Right? <coughs> so he doesn't stop at Ephesus. He goes on to Miletus, which is past it. And then he sends back to Ephesus for the elders of the church. And again, I think that's about 30 miles or so. <clears throat> when, they, um, when they arrived, he said to them, You know how I lived the whole time I was with you, from the first day I came into the province of Asia. I served the Lord with great humility and with tears and in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but I have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in your Lord Jesus. Notice how often when he's sort of reminding them of the past, Paul is saying, you know, you know, you know. Later he says, you experienced, you remember. He's making clear that they have, a, they have a vivid understanding of what their relationship with Paul has been like. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardship are facing me. However, I consider my life worthy, uh, worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Right? Whereas Paul is establishing, you know, you know, you know, to make them remember, he now gets into a period, a section here, where he's saying, here's what I know. Now I know that none of you, among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom, will ever see me again. Actually, we think he actually did run into some of them later, but at this point, they don't believe they'll ever see each other again. Therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you. What does he mean by that? I think he means, I did everything I could, I witnessed the gospel to you, and you were saved because of that. All right? I, I did my job, and because of that, when he talks about innocent of the blood, he means, you're saved. You know, the blood is a, is a metaphor there for salvation, that they are not lost. I am, not, I am innocent of the blood of any of you. I preach, you accept it, therefore you're saved because I preached to you. For I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. So watch out for the people. That's your job. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away <laughs> disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you, day and night, with tears. So Paul is reminding them of what his history has been with them. He's encouraging them to take care of the flock as the shepherds, the pastors, and uh, to, to be on guard, warning them of, that there's going to be hard times ahead. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by the kind of hard work, by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself uh, said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. 
Paul took virtually nothing. Now he was clear for the sake of other ministers to say a worker is worthy of his hire and that the, the people who are taught should support the teacher. But he himself worked with his own hands um, and particularly in cases where churches were poor, he did nothing to burden them and he was very clear on that elsewhere. When Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. Paul and his companions then head home. After we had torn ourselves away from them, we put out to sea and sailed straight to Kos. It's again, an island. The next day we went to Rhodes and from there to Patara. We found a ship uh, uh, crossing over to Phoenicia. Phoenicia is the Tyre and Sidon, you know, the area along there near Antioch. Went on board and set sail. After sighting Cyprus and passing to the south of it, we sailed on to Syria. We landed at Tyre, where our ship was to unload its cargo. We sought out the disciples there and, er and stayed with them seven days. Through the, though the Spirit urged, I'm sorry, through the Spirit they urged Paul not to go to <laughs> Jerusalem. When it was time to leave, we left and continued on our way. All of them, including wives and children, accompanied us out of the city. And there on the beach, we knelt to pray. After saying goodbye to each other, we went aboard the ship, and they returned home. We continued our voyage from Tyre and landed at Ptolemaeus, where we greeted the brothers and sisters and stayed with them for a day. Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea and stayed at the house of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven. Apparently, Philip has been living there for over 20 years, after the Ethiopian eunuch uh, event, and then being transported to another location and ministering in the areas of Samaria. He ended up in Caesarea and is settled there. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. And when, when it says he's one of the seven, that means one of the seven deacons. This is Philip the Evangelist, Philip the deacon. Okay. Last slide for today. After we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it, and said, the Holy Spirit says, in this way, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. When it says belt, it means more like a sash. He didn't take this kind of belt that tied his hands and feet together. Okay? When we heard this, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. When he would not be dissuaded, we gave up and said, The Lord's will be done. After this, we started on our way to Jerusalem. Some of the disciples from Caesarea accompanied us and brought us to the home of Nason. That's not a typo. Nason. M-N-A-S-O-N. -S where we were to stay. He was a man from Cyprus and one of the early disciples. Next week, in the first hour, we are going to deal with Paul's arrival in Jerusalem. His arrest, actually, his, his being grabbed by Jews and being beaten and then taken out of their hands by the Romans, sent to Rome, well, first to Caesarea for two years and then to Rome for trial. Um, so we will go through that next week. Uh, any questions about any of this? It Here. seems interesting that the Holy Spirit is telling people to tell Paul not to go, but the Holy Spirit is telling Paul to go. Yeah, it's, it, it, that's a very good question. It appears as though uh, the Holy Spirit is saying, don't go, Paul, because it's going to be trouble. That's not actually what it says. What it says is people, the Holy Spirit was telling people that Paul is going to have trouble in Jerusalem. It appears as though the people were taking that information that the Spirit was giving them and saying, so don't go, Paul. Yeah. It doesn't actually say that the Holy Spirit was, was telling them to warn Paul not to go. There's one place it could, could be read that way or it could be read the other way. So, because Paul said earlier, the Holy Spirit's been telling me everywhere I go that when I reach Jerusalem, I'm going to be in trouble, but I'm going anyway. And then he says it here. The indication is that Agabus the prophet and others were being told by the Spirit that Paul will be arrested, Paul will have difficulty. They were taking that information from the Spirit and making the next, taking the next step themselves and saying, therefore, don't go, Paul. Whereas the Holy Spirit, it appears, wanted Paul to go. God had plans for him. God had plans for him to go to Rome, which he did. All right. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. Have a great day. Thank you.